Hi, my name is Adelini from Iron Tipperary and I like to play football at Yama. Hi, we're very proud to introduce Dr. Chloe Lane and Dr. Harriet Smith, who will talk about sensory, cognitive and behavioural development in TBRS. Thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Erin Rooker. I am a TBRS mom. My daughter Morgan is nine, and I volunteer as the TBRS community's marketing manager and events committee lead. I am here today with Dr. Chloe Lane and Harriet Smith for presentations and a panel discussion on cognitive, behavioral, and sensory development. Dr. Chloe Lane is a research psychologist in the NHS and is interested in the neurodevelopmental and mental health conditions. She has a BSc and a PhD from the Department of Psychology at University of Sheffield. She has conducted research on the cognitive and behavioral phenotypes associated with rare genetic syndromes, including tatton brown raman syndrome, Soto syndrome, and Weaver syndrome. Also with us is Harriet Smith, who is a research associate at the University of Sheffield and a member of the Sheffield Autism Research Lab. She is a lead researcher on the Sensory Profiles in Rare Genetic Syndromes Project, and her research experience includes projects in genetic syndromes, autism spectrum conditions, tinnitus, and hearing health. Harriet is also in the last stages of her PhD, very exciting, at the University of Nottingham, which investigates the impact of tinnitus in children. Welcome ladies. Thank you both for being a part of the TBRS Family Conference 21. It's so great to have you with us both. I would like to get started with Dr. Lean first. Her presentation is titled TBRS Cognitive and Behavioral Phenotypes. Take it away, Dr. Lane. Great, thank you very much, Erin. Um, okay, so my name is Chloe Lane, and um, today I'm going to speak about a project that I worked on a couple of years ago. Uh, which was looking at kind of the cognitive and behavioural phenotypes associated with TBRX. Um, so just a little bit, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, so just a little bit of um, background to this research. So when I um, started this project, uh, TBRS was quite a new syndrome. Obviously, it's still fairly new. Um, and there hadn't been a lot of research looking at kind of cognitive and behavioural aspects of the syndrome. Um, there'd been some work by Tatton Brown and colleagues in 2018, uh, which was a clinical study um, of 55 individuals with TBRS. And that study reported that intellectual disability and behavioural and or psychiatric issues were um, quite common for individuals with TBRS. Um, and something which um, obviously impacts day-to-day -day life is kind of learning and behaviour. Um, and so identifying um, in detail the cognitive and behavioural characteristics associated with um, specific syndromes can be really important for identifying um, the appropriate support and interventions that might be helpful for um, an individual. And so this kind of approach has been applied to other rare syndromes, and it was something that we wanted to um, try to do with TBRS. Um, so the main focus of this study was to look at sort of intellectual ability and learning profiles and social skills and behaviour. And so we did this using a combination of both in-person assessment, so working directly with um, adults and children with a diagnosis of TBRS, and also um, parent caregiver questionnaires. And so our kind of main research questions were to um, try to establish the range of intellectual ability associated with TBRS, 
um, to see whether the syndrome is associated with a specific learning profile, so kind of relative cognitive strengths and weaknesses, um, and also to see how common autistic traits were for individuals with TBRS. Um, so in the study, we had 18 individuals um, take part. And so um, some of these individuals were recruited from the NHS in the UK. Um, some were recruited via the Child Growth Foundation. Um, and we also um, had some participants um, take part via the TBRS community. So I was really fortunate to be able to come over to one of the family conferences and work with um, some of the individuals attending the conference. So the average age of um, our participants was 17 and a half, and they ranged in age from seven through to 33. Um, so we had six adults take part and the remaining participants were children. Um, we had 11 males and seven females. And as I mentioned, some of the participants were from the UK and some were from the US. Um, so the measures that we used in this study uh, was something called the British Ability Scales, which is a standardised cognitive assessment. So it's kind of similar to the Weschler Scales. Um, so it gives kind of an overall indication of an individual's intellectual ability um, using a range of different um, tasks to tap into different uh, cognitive skills. So things like learning, memory, attention. Um, and then we also um, used the autism diagnostic observation schedule to look at autistic traits. So this is a semi-structured behavioural observation. Um, and so all of our participants completed both of those um, sort of assessments with me. Um, we then also asked participants um, or parents to complete um, a questionnaire uh, on, on kind of according for their child. Um, so this was the social responsiveness scale, which looks at kind of social behaviours and also autistic traits. And so 12 um, of our participants' parents completed and returned this questionnaire. Um, so just to give a bit more detail about the um, cognitive assessment that we use. So on the right hand side are um, the core scales. So these are the individual tasks that all of our participants completed. And so um, as you can see, there are two um, verbal tasks, two nonverbal reasoning tasks and two spatial tasks. Um, so the two tasks for each ability are kind of combined to give a score for verbal ability, for nonverbal reasoning ability and for spatial ability. And then um, the three cluster scores are then kind of used to generate a GCA, which is a general conceptual ability score. And this is what's equivalent to um, an IQ score. Um, so the assessment allows us to look at kind of overall ability level and then um, look at kind of the learning profile in terms of these clusters and also looking at kind of individual um, tasks. So in terms of the findings, um, this uh, figure shows the distribution of these general conceptual ability scores for our participants. Um, so 100 is the sort of population average and then um, kind of scores below 70 would indicate intellectual disability um, and then scores between sort of 70 to 90 would be in the kind of borderline intellectual ability range. Um, so within our um, group of participants, the range of scores was 39 to 76. Um, so the majority of the participants had an intellectual disability, but there was kind of quite a bit of variability um, within the group and some individuals in that kind of borderline intellectual ability range. Um, and the average uh, GCA score was 53. Um, so we then looked at the three cluster scores that I mentioned previously. So in the blue, um, is verbal ability, 
and then red is nonverbal reasoning and green is spatial. Um, and so uh, what we found here was that verbal ability was significantly better than both nonverbal reasoning ability and spatial ability. So our participants found the verbal tasks um, kind of easier than the nonverbal reasoning and spatial tasks. Um, you can also see that the um, nonverbal reasoning, there was kind of less variability in performance in that um, cluster. So um, this kind of suggests that, you know, most of our participants did find those tasks quite challenging. Um, and then there was a bit more variability in the verbal ability and the spatial tasks. So to kind of look into that a bit further, we've then got the data for um, each of the individual tasks that participants completed. Um, so you can see in the blue, the two verbal tasks, um, very similar performance across those two tasks. Um, again, with the nonverbal reasoning, participants were finding um, both of those tasks kind of a similar level of difficulty. Um, and then what was quite interesting was in the spatial tasks. So um, the recognition of designs uh, task is a measure of visuospatial memory. So um, basically participants are shown um, a, a picture of a geometric shape for five seconds. And then they have to um, identify that shape from a kind of group of four very similar looking shapes. Um, and so we found that participants were scoring um, quite well on that task. So similarly to how they were doing on the verbal tasks, but having much greater difficulty with the pattern construction task. So this one requires um, participants to use sort of 3D blocks with different uh, sides on them. And they've got to kind of manipulate those blocks to create um, a like an image on a page. So um, they've got to kind of integrate that information and use those sort of logic and problem solving skills to work out how to make the blocks look the same as the picture. And so that was something that um, participants had a little bit more difficulty with. Um, so overall, the um, learning profile identified um, that our participants had particular strengths in verbal skills. So that was both verbal understanding and verbal expression. Um, but it was important to note that a small number of children that I worked with did have quite limited verbal abilities. And so um, it was kind of um, a real strength for those that were um, verbal, but um, doesn't necessarily um, sort of generalize to everybody with TBRS. Another thing to note is that um, there are some additional tasks in the assessment that um, aren't kind of included in the main um, analysis, but one of those measures auditory memory um, and participants scored particularly well on that task. Um, so it's being able to um, recall information um, that they'd heard via um, kind of the auditory modality. So um, listing a, um, no, sorry, saying a, a sequence of numbers and then asking them to repeat it back. Um, particular difficulties that we found were uh, to do with sort of logic and problem solving. And then, as I mentioned, with those kind of visual constructive skills, which were part of the pattern construction task. Um, so all of the participants had um, either intellectual disability or borderline intellectual ability. Um, and this suggests that children with TBRS are likely to require support with their learning. Um, and we also found you know, some evidence of an un uneven learning profile with um, sort of fairly consistent strengths and difficulties between participants. So I'll now move on to talk a bit about um, autistic traits. So um, there are two key features of autism. Uh, so the first is social communication impairment. Um, and examples of this are things like difficulties with nonverbal communication. So um, kind of gestures or facial expressions, um, difficulties with social emotional reciprocity, 
So that's kind of the back and forth of conversation and also difficulties with developing and maintaining friendships and relationships. Um, another feature of autism is sort of restricted interests and in repetitive behaviours. So um, examples of these could include excessive adherence to routines, highly restricted or repetitive interests, and then stereotyped or repetitive speech, motor movements, or use of objects. Um, so in this uh, study, we um, assessed autistic traits using um, the ADOS, which I mentioned briefly earlier. So this is kind of a gold standard um, autism uh, measure. And um, the way it works is that it's a kind of semi-structured interview or play session, depending on the age of the child. And it provides an opportunity to observe behaviours in real time and to sort of elicit autistic traits um, if an individual um, sort of displays those traits. And um, the ADOS allows behaviour to be scored on a spectrum. So um, an individual can be sort of classified as non-spectrum, autism spectrum or autism. Um, but obviously just to note that um, although this assessment is sometimes used as part of the autism diagnostic process, um, kind of scores on this alone wouldn't diagnose somebody with autism. So although somebody might score as autism on this assessment, kind of a lot more information would be need to be taken into account to actually sort of diagnose somebody. Um, so just to kind of bear that in mind. Um, and then the tasks um, or activities that we do within the assessment are things like telling a, telling a story from a book, talking about emotions or free play. And again, these are kind of tailored to the age of the child. So um, within the group of participants who took part in this study, um, five of them scored in that kind of autism range, three in the autism spectrum range, and then 10 in the non-spectrum range. Um, on the right, these are the calibrated severity scores. So basically, these can range from one to 10. And in this sample, um, they range from one to nine. So 10 being kind of more severe and one being less severe. Um, and these are a way of um, comparing participants who took part in the slightly different versions, depending on the age that they were. Um, Something that we kind of noted in the study was that none of the adults who participated scored in the kind of autism or autism spectrum range um, based on this observation. Um, so just some kind of um, observations from uh, this assessment. So um, some of the individuals that I kind of worked with were really talkative and sociable and engaging during the session and really happy to kind of speak about various aspects of their lives. Um, children with less speech tended to use quite a lot of echolalia and stereotype phrases. So this is kind of repeating um, what I've said or repeating phrases that they've heard elsewhere that might not necessarily be relevant to the context. Or the situation. Um, some individuals had some difficulties with sort of describing and understanding emotions. And then although um, this assessment was obviously looking at a kind of snapshot of current behaviours, um, something that we weren't able to capture was um, kind of changes over time. But I thought I would just note that a small number of parents had reported some regression um, for some of their children. Um, so another thing that we looked at was the relationship between autistic traits and intellectual ability. Um, so we found an association suggesting that um, individuals with higher intellectual ability tended to have less autistic traits based on that um, observation, uh, the autism ADOS assessment. Um, Obviously, this um, isn't kind of a causal link, um, and it's just an association that we, um, we found in the data. Um, and then just briefly talking about the um, parental questionnaire. So um, 
some of the difficulties that came out um, on this were things like thinking or talking about the same thing over and over, not recognizing when others are trying to take advantage of them, um, not being able to get their mind off something and uh, having difficulties with coordination. And then strengths were things like offering comfort to others when they're sad, not avoiding people who want to be emotionally close to them, facial expressions matching what they're saying um, and not being emotionally distant. Um, so just to summarize um, that kind of part of the um, project. So we found that autistic traits were fairly common in TVRS, but there was a real um, variability in kind of the uh, level of autistic traits between individuals. Um, the data seemed to suggest that these traits were less pronounced in adults with TBRS, but obviously it's important to note that we only had six adults in the study um, and that we were only looking at a snapshot, so we can't um, kind of extrapolate whether um, these traits have changed over time at all or across development for these individuals. Um, and although that we didn't necessarily see these traits in the um, kind of direct assessment, parents still reported that um, social difficulties were um, kind of common for uh, adults with TBRS. Um, and yeah, we kind of found that individuals with more severe intellectual ability tended to have more of these autistic traits. Um, so if anybody is interested in um, kind of reading a bit more about this project, um, the work's been published in an academic journal and it can be accessed here. Um, and if anybody uh, would like me to send a copy, then I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank um, the TBRS community for inviting me to speak today and for supporting the research. Um, and obviously to all of the families who kindly participated in the study and who made it possible. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to answering any questions. Um, I'll hand over to Harriet now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was wonderful. Uh, now we will hear from Harriet. Her presentation is titled Sensory processing differences and associated behavior in TBRS. Take it away. Thank you, both of you. Um, so, hopefully, you can hear me. So, um, my name is Harriet. So, today I'm going to talk to you about a recently completed study um, that investigated sensory processing differences and associated behavior in TBRS. So first of all, what is sensory processing? So sensory processing refers to how our brain receives information from the senses. So our sensory systems detect sensory inputs. This information is sent to our brains via our nerves. Our brain then recognizes this input and processes it in order to organize a response. So there are eight key senses and five of these are our core senses. So these are touch, hearing, vision, taste and smell. And we also have three additional internal senses. So these are proprioception, um, which is a sense that lets us know where our limbs are and how they are moving. Vestibular, which maintains our balance, posture and eye movement. And interoception, which detects information from our internal organs um, and allows us to feel sensations such as hunger, tiredness and headaches. So sensory processing is essential to pretty much um, every experience that we have. And we often need to process lots of different pieces of sensory information at any one time. So what are sensory processing differences? So many children and adults experience sensory processing differences. And that can mean that they experience the world around them differently. So, um, so sensory processing uh, differences when they occur in children can mean that children sometimes face challenges in their participation in day-to-day -day activities or in certain environments. And these can have a wide ranging impact depending on the sensory differences experienced. So this could um, affect learning, eating, so the ability to obtain a balanced diet, 
or things such as leisure or travel, um, sleeping or behaviour. An occupational therapist um, called Winnie Dunn, Dr. Winnie Dunn, um, proposed a model uh, to explain children's processing of sensory information. So Dunn proposed um, that children's processing of sensory information uh, could be explained by the relationship between two factors. So these are neurological thresholds or the detection of sensory inputs and self-regulation, so the reaction to sensory input. And the interaction between these two factors results in four different possible patterns um, of sensory processing. So these um, are awareness, or sometimes this is referred to as registration. And this is where children miss or seem to have low awareness of sensory information. So these children might find it difficult to um, identify objects that are obvious to other people. Uh, they might get tired easily, but they also might be very comfortable in different types of sensory environments. There's also a sensory seeking pattern. So these are children who are more interested in sensory information than others. So these might be children who enjoy um, touching uh, different textures. They might put objects in their mouth or they might get excited um, during movement activity. There's also sensory sensitivity. So this is children who detect more sensory information than others. So they might notice um, sensory stimulus very easily, or they might become um, distracted by the environment around them a little bit more easily. There's also um, the avoiding pattern. So this is children who might actively avoid or become overwhelmed by sensory inputs. Um, so this could be um, children that that like sameness, so they have a tendency um, towards routine because this ensures that there is a predictable um, sensory input um, for them. And it also might be children who um, become emotional or overwhelmed um, in certain sen sensory environments. For example, putting their hands over their ear, um, ears um, in noisy environments. And it's important to note um, that sensory differences can be really varied. So it's very unlikely for a child to fall in any one of these four categories. And actually sensory processing patterns might vary within individuals. So you might have a child that is seeking in terms of touch sensation, um, but is avoiding in terms of sound. So the Sheffield Autism Research Lab has conducted um, a number of research studies looking at the cognitive and behavioural phenotypes of um, overgrowth syndromes, um, as we have heard um, Chloe um, talk about um, in, in the previous presentation. And through this work, the team has um, had close interaction with partner associations, um, such as the Child Growth Foundation and uh, the TBRS community. And it was actually through uh, conversations with family members of the Child Growth Foundation that sensory processing was identified as a priority area for research. And important, importantly, families um, told us that improved understanding of sensory processing differences would help to support individuals um, in, in their day to day life and, and families as well. But to date, um, no research has been published on the nature of sensory processing in either TBRS or SOTA syndrome. So the aims of this research were to investigate how sensory information is processed by children with TBRS and to identify whether there are any specific sensory profiles associated with each syndrome with, with TBRS um, and we looked at a couple of other syndromes as well. And to evaluate whether sensory processing differences are associated with other clinical features, such as anxiety, depression, ADHD, autistic traits, and adaptive behavior.
So many of you uh, will be familiar with the study because many of you um, participated. So a huge thank you to those of you who were eligible and able to participate. So the approach that we took, um, so this was a questionnaire study and it involved um, parents and caregivers of children with um, TBRS and SOTOS syndrome. So we used seven standardized questionnaires um, that were parent and caregiver reported, so completed by, by the parent or caregiver. And two of those looked at the child's sensory processing. So this was the, the child's sensory profile two and the sensory behavior questionnaire. So the child's sensory profile two looked at um, sensory um, differences in terms of a modality level, so on a sensory system level. And it also um, measured sensory differences in terms of DUNS four uh, patterns of sensory processing. The sensory behavior questionnaire looked at the frequency of sensory behaviors and their impact. So the two questionnaires there provide us, provided us with slightly um, different information to give us a detailed picture um, of this aspect. We also administered questionnaires about other clinical features um, on autistic traits, anxiety, um, ADHD, adaptive behavior and epilepsy. So to take part, um, the uh, participant had to be a parent or caregiver of a child with TBRS or SOTOS syndrome, and the child had to be aged between three years and 14 years, 11 months. So recruitment took place um, this year, so between January and July, and we recruited 36 um, parents and caregivers of children with SOTA syndrome and 20 parents and caregivers of children with TBRS. So to provide um, a summary of the findings from the study, um, this slide reports the, the data from the child sensory profile too. So first looking at the modality scores, so the sensory, uh, different kind of sensors. Um, so this chart compares uh, data from the, the SOTA syndrome group, the, the TBRS group, to a sample, um, a normative sample. So this is, um, the sensory behaviours that we would expect to see in a general population. So we can see if we look at the middle column here, um, the grey bars refer to sensory behaviour that's just like the majority of others, whereas the blue bars refer to sensory behaviour that is more or much more different than the majority of others. So the larger the blue are, uh, the more sensory differences there are. So we can see for TBRS um, that there were differences in the processing of body position information, touch information and movement information, and also for some children differences in the processing of auditory information. But we can see that processing of oral and visual information is perhaps more similar to what we would see um, in the general population. So this quote um, illustrates um, a child um, that experienced uh, poor balance and um, bumping into people. And um, this is uh, sort of aligned with um, difficulties in processing body position and movement information. So the next slide uh, presents the data for those four sensory processing patterns. So this time we're looking at the green bars, which show um, sensory behaviours that are more or much more um, different uh, than the majority of others. So we can see in the TBRS group um, that the vast majority there, or, the, or all of the um, children with TBRS showed um, differences that were consistent with the low awareness registration category. Uh, there were also um, consistent behaviours um, in the group with the sensitivity, uh, seeking and avoiding um, pattern as well. Um, so again, this quote illustrates um, a child 
that showed sensory sensitivity um, when being bumped into or brushed against. However, um, when she was injured or you know had grazes on her face and hands, she was less um, sensitive. Um, so a little bit of a contradiction there almost in terms of um, her sensory processing pattern, which was in fact quite common um, across the participants um, in the study. So it's common to have um, almost different patterns within the same modality, depending on sort of the contextual of environment of, um, of the, the sensory processing. So this slide presents um, data from the sensory behaviour questionnaire. So this is now looking at the frequency and the impact of children's sensory behaviours. And in the charts here, you can see that we've compared Cytos syndrome and TBRS to a neurotypical sample and an autism sample. And this is from a different research study. And in this chart, um, the lower the score on the y-axis um, represents um, great, a greater number, so a greater frequency or a greater impact of sensory behaviours. Um, so with um, TBRS here, we can see that the, the group of um, individuals with TBRS had significantly more um, sen uh, sensory um, behaviours and um, the impact of sensory behaviours than the neurotypical group. Um, and this was similar for the SOTOS. Um, group as well. And the, the frequency and impact of behaviours was similar to the autism group, uh, where we know sensory um, differences are a key characteristic. We also looked at the relationship between sensory differences and other clinical features. So this chart um, on the left here um, shows the relationship between the variables that we looked at in the study. And the data presented um, indicates where a relationship was found. Um, and this is specific to the TBRS group, this, this chart. So it only shows the data for, for the TBRS group. And we can see that increased severity, if we look at the yellow sort of highlights, we can see that increased severity of um, sensory processing differences um, was related to a number of clinical features, including autistic traits, anxiety, executive functioning problems, hyperactivity and peer relation difficulty. And further analysis and inspection showed that autistic traits was the most important associated clinical feature. So in light of the research, we can see here that um, children with TPS, TBRS do experience a number of sensory processing differences. Um, so in order to um, disseminate um, this information and uh, provide um, some, some information and support, we've developed um, a parent caregiver booklet on sensory processing in TBRS. And um, so this provides some information about sensory processing, it provides um, some of the results from the study and also some useful strategies that may be used to help support children with sensory processing differences. And I've pulled out on this slide um, a couple of examples of those strategies that can be used and sort of selected based on the individual differences of the child. Um, so for children that might um, kind of uh, exhibit patterns in the low awareness and registration category. Um, it might be useful to visit places that offer a variety of sensory um, experiences. Um, and for example, if they are um, kind of exhibiting uh, low awareness patterns in regards to um, the touch and, and sort of temperature information, uh, for example, using extra care when drinking hot liquids and eating hot food. So some of these sort of practical um, examples and adjustments that can be made um, to support um, their child, uh, the child's sensory processing differences. <laughs> 
So just to say um, a huge thank you to the project team um, and the project funder and um, the Children's Hospital Charity and our collaborators um, who supported um, the recruitment for the study, including uh, TBRS community. And thank you very much um, to TBRS community for inviting me to talk today. And again, I really look forward to answering uh, your questions. Awesome. Thank you both. You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I just learned so much and it, I felt like you were talking about my daughter the entire time. Um, I'd like to spend the rest of our time just discussing, asking a few questions, and then definitely if there's anything um, between the two of you that you would like to discuss, I, I would love to encourage that as well. Um, my first question is, um, there was so much overlap um, between the two of your presentations and obviously you two collaborate closely. Um, what, what can we look for as sort of an outcome or the next steps to both of these studies? Where do you hope to go with this information? Um. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, I think um, hopefully, certainly with the with the sensory profile study, um, we've we've found some new information that will help um, support families. Um, and I don't know. Um, I, I think in terms of we're we're quite interested to hear the feedback around um, the information that that we've found, and our ears are very open in terms of what families would like us to look at, and if there is there if there is anything that's kind of resonating here, um, uh, that you know would be of interest to in families for us to look into further. So that's definitely something that I'm. I'm interested to hear about. Yeah, I think um, with the studies that we've done, obviously, with the studies that we've done, they the syndrome is still the syndrome is still um, um, fairly. It might be yours, Harriet. Yeah, maybe mute yourself. Maybe mute yourself. Um, obviously the syndrome is still quite new so we were doing some kind of initial studies to just look at um, kind of broadly what are the profiles and what are the kind of areas um, of strength and of difficulties and as Harriet said I think um, research needs to be very much guided by families and so it'd be really interesting to see you know whether people have thoughts um, in the discussion about, um, you know, whether there's areas either coming from the work that we've already done or just other ideas about things that researchers should be taking forward. Um, and then, yeah, as how it said, making sure they're disseminated appropriately so that they're going to kind of have a difference and make an impact for families. Yeah, that I, I see the value behind what you're studying so much um, really, when it comes to, I know um, within our TBS board, we've talked a lot about developing formal clinical um, guidelines for, um, you know, doctors when they're seeing patients and, and trying to align, you know, this, this child has the variant, but do they display the clinical description that aligns with that to really get the formal TBRS diagnosis? And I think... Um, Part of your study, if we can get more of that data and we can build on some of those clinical guidelines, when it comes time for um, a child to get a formal diagnosis and we are given that TBRS diagnosis, it just creates so much more opportunity for either um, uh, support and other um, resources for the families as far as like education plans or therapeutic support, you know, getting healthcare approval for, you know, occupational speech, ABA type therapies. Um, and I, I would also be really interested, I know healthcare systems work 
differently in the United States than they do in, in the UK and elsewhere in the world. Do you um, collaborate with any other universities or healthcare systems um, as of yet, or are there opportunities you're looking for to maybe broaden um, your research base? Harriet, I, we can't hear you. And, and Chloe, I think you're muted. Your audio, Harriet, we can't hear you. Chloe, do you have any thoughts on that or? Um. So with the project that I did, I collaborated with um, Dr. Tatton Brown, um, and um, that was really, you know, really helpful. And particularly in terms of kind of identifying eligible um, people. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of getting, kind of finding people with TBRS, it is really important to link up with other professionals. Um, and to think about, you know, all aspects of the syndrome, and like you were saying, kind of linking up the genetics and the kind of the education and the behaviour, um, and I guess being able to provide that more kind of detailed information on diagnosis would be really helpful for families as well. And obviously working closely with charities is really important and making sure that um, your re research that's being done is actually like what, what families want, um, want to be done. Um, do you, sorry, I just had a question and I was thinking about Harriet joining us and I got distracted. Um, do you have plans for doing like a second round of research or are there ways that our families can get more involved and, and help with research? Um, so probably me personally at the moment, I'm not kind of working directly in this, this area. Um, but it is something that maybe I'll come back to. Um, and, but I know the um, team that Harriet's working in at the moment, so the Sheffield Autism Research Lab, I think they're very much involved in this genetic syndromes research at the moment. And um, uh, they would always be happy to hear from families who might be interested in getting involved in research um, and kind of being part of their database, um, being able to find out about new studies. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no problem. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't quite catch um, Chloe's answer there. Um, shall I, just to answer that question from my perspective, maybe. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of, of collaboration, I think um, we, we're so looking into this and we have ideas for kind of um, a project that would integrate the perspectives of um, families and professionals, clinicians and researchers um, to have that sort of two-way conversation around sort of where to go in terms of uh, not only um, new ideas for research but uh, making sure that there's impact and um, widespread dissemination of, of what we've found out about as well. Um, so it's definitely a priority um, for us um, at, at Sheffield. Yeah, I would I would love to um, have you guys kind of direct us. And I, I know um, the TBRS community is so eager to, you know, get more answers. And the only way we're going to do that is by um, volunteering, whether that's answering some of the studies like we did for you, Harriet, or you know, participating in other sorts of research um, programs. And so I think um, following the conference and after our panel discussion here, we will be having the Q&A from the community. So they might have more direct questions for you, but would love to be able to share your contact information if um, agreeable to, you know, either put in a, a list for future studies when you do approach that, Chloe or Harriet, um, 
if your your center at Sheffield is um, actively doing other research, I, I know um, a lot of our families are very eager to participate and help get those answers. Um, one question I did have, Chloe, specifically for you on your research, um, I noted how you found in adults that their traits of the autism spectrum characteristics tend to, tended to be less. Do you find that that was the nature of the individuals you studied, or do you think that's more indicative of um, maybe the, the kids grow out or mature out of some of those autistic traits as they get older? That's a really good question. So I think, um, you know, it's difficult to say for the individuals that I directly worked with whether their traits had changed over time um, because we only looked at that kind of snapshot. Um, but we know from the autism literature that um, sometimes um, autistic traits do become less pronounced as individuals get older. And so this could be the case for individuals with TBRS. Um, but I guess to kind of answer that question, um, we'd need to do some sort of longitudinal research looking over time and probably working with more people. Because um, as I mentioned, we had quite a small sample. Um, yeah, I think it'd be something really interesting to look at in a bit more detail and see what, what that kind of trajectory looks like. Excellent. And then I know, Harriet, that sort of overlaps slightly with yours. And I did have a question about um, when you were looking at some of the sensory modalities, which I think was the blue graph and the sensory patterns, the green graph. Could you give maybe a little more um, description of what some examples might be in those? Sure. Um, so in terms of, uh, so the ones where we're seeing the most differences um, for the TBRS group are body position, touch and movements. So if we're looking um, at body position, um, these are kind of sensory differences around perhaps um, the child uh, needing props to support themselves, um, uh, kind of feeling tired um, after, you know, kind of expending lots of energy, um, that type of thing with body position, um, you know, ha having a weakness um, kind of about them sort of physically. Um, and then in terms of touch, uh, it was a real range um, in terms of differences and uh, kind of many different patterns in terms of those differences. So that might be seeking out touch or being sensitive to touch and also some aspects of the sort of low awareness as well. So having a sort of low awareness of um, pain or um, other, other aspects, so temperature, for example. Um, and in regards to movement, um, it, it was a mix of sort of seeking, so seeking movement, getting excited um, about movement activities, um, and also sort of uh, the more, um, I guess the, the registration low awareness pattern within that as well, in terms of um, kind of being clumsy, bumping into things, that type of thing. Um, so that's an example of sort of those modalities, if, if that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And that it makes me think, um, so I'm hoping you both are aware that the TBRS community has formally put together a patient registry to do um, a rare disease registry and it's the natural history study, I think is what they call it. Um, so that's actually launching, I think this week, hopefully. And um, our community is super excited about it. We're trying to really encourage all of the families to participate. And I would love to hear um, what maybe that database of information, if we could get a good sampling from our community um, what you might be able to do with that sort of information if we share it with you and where that might be able to help your work. I think, um, yeah, the, the thing that I'm thinking of um, kind of immediately is any future studies. Um, so whether we could, you know, 
if you're collecting certain types of information for us to be aware of the types of information that are on, on the registry and maybe factor that in to some of the, the research planning that, that we're doing and also being, being able to reach um, participants in order to invite them to projects. So I think, yeah, it sounds like a really exciting um, registry that could really help um, facilitate research in the future. And I think um, being able to kind of link up different bits of information. So I guess as research projects, we're very mindful of how much we're asking people to do. And so maybe we don't want to ask too much um, uh, or ask families to complete too many questionnaires. Um, but having access to like a resource where there's kind of all so much information about one individual. Um, I think that would be really helpful to kind of link up maybe sort of medical and psychological and behavioural um, aspects, which is something that maybe we couldn't do kind of in isolation. Excellent. Excellent. Well, all right. Well, I think our time is about up. Thank you both. It was lovely speaking with you and I really enjoyed your presentations. And I look forward to letting the community hear this and having you guys join us at our family conference in a week or so. So thank you. I hope you enjoy your evenings and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Bye, guys. Bye.